Junk Miles. Ten Junk Miles. Ten Junk Miles. Ten Junk Miles. Hey everybody, <clears throat> welcome to Ten Junk Miles. Uh, this is going to be a long run episode with my two friends, Naomi Plasterer and Lourdes Gutierrez Callum. Did I say that right? <laughs> yeah, I, tried sort to, of. I tried to pronounce it kind of like her, but it didn't work out really well. Um, and these are both people that I know and um, that I had the pleasure of meeting and spending time with at um, Arrowhead. Naomi, I actually talk to all the time. And um, they both just... Hey, we met at the Beer Mile. We met at the Beer Mile for the Leadville 100. That was the first time I ever met her. Uh, although she wasn't <laughs> tough enough to run the Beer Mile. It was uh, Corbin and the dog were the only two that actually did the running. Um, and they just recently completed the White Mountain 100 in Alaska on Monday. And... Um, I just thought it would be really interesting to hear about that race, hear about their experience. Um, a lot of people have asked me questions about winter ultras and, and what winter ultras they can try and things like that. And did you guys both do Sasitna as well? Yes. Yeah. Okay. So th- these are two people that have participated in three winter ultras this year so far. So that's a little crazy. No, no, no. We did. No, no. We did Sasitna last year. Okay. So you guys did Sasitna together last year, and then you did Arrowhead and White Mountain together this year. Yeah, but we didn't do Sasitna together last year. We didn't know each other. Oh, did you meet there? That's how we met, okay. yeah. All right, so you guys met at Sasitna. I met Lourdes at Arrowhead, and me and Naomi met at a beer mile. This, just to set the <laughs> stage for everyone. Um <laughs> And they just just finished this race Wednesday. In fact, there's pictures of Naomi's knee. It's it's like um, as large as a person with cellulitis who's like a hundred. Um, so she's still. In she it. does have an old soul. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's and just, apparently old knees. Yeah. yeah. Ancient. Let's, at least you didn't have trench foot, right? Yeah. Thank God. So let's um, set the table a little bit, and we'll just start with Naomi. Just for the listeners, no one knows about the White Mountain 100. So can you just tell us a little bit about it? Where is it, the logistics of it, the, you know, the data, the raw data that you do know? Yeah, so the White Mountain 100 is in Fairbanks, Alaska. It's just north of Fairbanks. It's in late March because in I don't know if you know anything about Fairbanks, but Fairbanks in like December is negative 40 at like noon and the sun never shows up. So they try to put it at the end of March so that you get like a reasonable amount of daylight and the temperatures don't generally like they're, they're, they're normal temps like twenties and below. Um, yeah. And then it's an advanced winter ultra. So you have to have done an, an, another winter ultra before this one. And they don't actually require any gear, um, which is why it's advanced. So pretty much like bring whatever you think you're going to need, but we're not going to tell you you need anything. Um, Yeah, so you can pack it or you can sled it depending on how much stuff you take or what you want to do. And it's 100 miles long. 101. 101. And do you know what the uh, um, vertical climb is of it? Yeah, I think it has like 9,500 feet of gain or something like that. Okay. And, <clears throat> Lord, is why did you choose to do White Mountain 100? Like, what drew you to this race? Uh, I was pacing at the Hurt 100 uh, two years ago, and I met another guy who's pacing. We were just talking, waiting for our runners to come in, and he happened to be from Alaska. And he was telling me about the Susitna because I was getting ready to run the Susitna. And he said, well, if you ever come back to Alaska, run the White Mountains because that's the most beautiful race he'd ever done. Interesting. And did was it the most beautiful race that you ever did? Uh, no. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Be, be, it, I have to say it was the most beautiful winter run I've ever done. So it's prettier than Arrowhead. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, let's be fair. I mean, Arrowhead, all the, like, hills and stuff that you do, you're pretty much in the dark. 
you know, at least for me, it was this year. And, you know, it's, it's pretty flat and you see the same thing for 135 miles. Whereas this race has mountains and topography and things like that. Right. Well, I don't know. It depends. It depends where you live. I'm not sure if we would call them mountains. I mean, I thought they were more hills. You know, it wasn't really like mountainous. But I think when you look at like how flat Fairbanks is or how fat, flat like Susitna is in those terms. So, I mean, I would consider them more like foothills. Okay. It was, you know, the grades, the grades were quite runnable. So it, it wasn't, it wasn't like you were doing a true mountain ultra. You see what I'm saying? Sure. And, and just, you guys yeah. feel free to interrupt each other and jump in on each other as much as you can, as much as you want to. I'll direct questions at people just because I hate when I ask a question and everybody answers at the same time, but feel free to pile on. Um, I mean, you know, uh, that was a kind of our consensus between the two of us. We both live in pretty mountainous areas. And we felt like it was, it was, you know, nice and it was hilly, but it didn't feel like mountains that you could barely climb. Yeah, I kept complaining the whole time that the, the course was too runnable. <laughs> okay. I wasn't expecting it to be so runnable. <laughs> right. And, and, but to be fair now, you're in, I mean, Naomi, you, you're basically a, a hobo. Where, where, where are you geographically right now, <laughs> technically? Uh, I'm, I'm in a, in a closet in Tahoe. <laughs> okay. And and you you live sometimes out of your van, basically. Yeah, yeah. I'll be back in the van once it stops snowing. It's snowed today here. And Lourdes, you're in Calgary? Uh, yeah, I'm in Calgary, about 20 minutes from the Rockies, and is that which st- are mountains. Okay, so, yeah, and, and you guys, you know, like. Lord, as you did fat dog. I mean, those are, those are mountain races. So I can totally see right. what you're saying. And, um, right, well, right. compare, um, Naomi, compare this race to Susitna in terms of the view and in terms of the climbing and all of that. No, I mean, there's no comparison. Susitna's flat. Like, <laughs> and it, and it's totally a lot flat. of it's on a, yeah, no, it's, like it's not totally flat. flat. <laughs> not, it's not totally flat. It's, it's got some climbs, but it, it doesn't have, it, it, what she's saying is true. It's this, you know, you see Mount, like you're going along, you can see the mountains. You're kind of going in between them sometimes, you know, part of it was we got up to the divide. I got up there as it was getting dark. So obviously at the top of the divide, then you can really see the mountain range, but because then we went into darkness, then you really couldn't see. I mean, I got to see a little bit of it, but you know, they say that the prettiest miles were kind of mile 40 to 60, but, you know, a lot of that was in dark. And now, so yeah. you guys have participated in a few different winter ultras, and you kind of piqued my interest when you said there's no required gear. I mean, the other, all the races I've done, you've had to have a, basically a sled, and you have to have a certain sleeping bag and certain supplies and things like that. Um, right. They literally don't care what you bring? No, yeah. some... Well, no, yeah, well, some people do it. Some people do it just with, with a camelback. The lady who won did it with a camelback and just ran the whole time. Right. Was it? Is it runnable? Could you just run the whole race? Well, she did. What was her time? Do you know? I think it's twenty yeah, four, like twenty three hours. Okay. Um, did you guys? Break I couldn't sleds? Run the whole thing. Yeah. No, I did. You used the sled. Yeah, I packed it. You didn't use the sled at all. I didn't use the sled at all. No, I packed it. Interesting. So let's take um, Lord, as soon as you used the sled, what yeah. gear did you not bring that you would have used at Arrowhead? Because you were an Arrowhead finisher with me this year. Okay. So my Arrowhead sled probably weighed somewhere about 35 pounds okay. because of the sleeping bag, bivy, all the stuff that was mandatory. This, this sled maybe weighed 12 to 15 Uh, Some of the mandatory stuff, you know, I did take like a, I took like a safety blanket just in case I, you know, took extra socks and it was mine. Mine was mostly uh, food and extra clothing. Do you get drop bags in this race? No, that's the, that was the issue. That's why I took the sled was because there are no drop bags and um, I'm pretty picky about what I eat. And so I wanted to carry all my food and, and I, I did worry a bit 
with the water situation, I was using a camelback just in case it fr- freezes. I wanted to make sure. So I had some extra bottles just in case. So no sleeping bag, no bivy, mm-hmm. none of that. Right. No stove. No. Yeah. The, I mean, those are like, you know, the, the big main things that they make you take. I didn't have any of it. Is this the kind of race where people don't bivy usually? No, no, because you have cabins in the cabins. They're tw- like about 20 miles apart. And if they're going to sleep, they just sleep in a cabin. So there's there like- were people sl- and there were there were people sleeping in cabins. So it's maybe like uh, five checkpoints, four checkpoints in the, in the race. Uh, it's four. It's four checkpoints that are like, like I said, average about 20 miles apart. And then in the last 60 miles in between at the 10 mile mark, there's either a shelter or like a medical tent that you can just like emergency wise, if you need to jump in. And actually at one guy that hurt himself was in one of those emergency tents waiting to be picked up. Okay. So then Naomi, what did you have in your backpack? Obviously you didn't take a, um, sleeping bag and a bivy sack then. So what did you, what did you bring? What didn't you bring? Um, I brought a pair, I brought a pair of fleece pants and a fleece jacket, uh, emergency blanket, like the really tiny ones that the backcountry skiers use. And then, um, food and yeah, food. Oh, and stocks. But yeah, that was it. I didn't have anything. Uh, in what kind oh, and, of, in a, go ahead. Well, I was going to say in a frozen bladder frozen <laughs> in like the first five miles. So is the whole idea that, you know, it could get scary and it could get cold, but we're not that far from safety at all times. So if all else fails, you could just like drop everything and haul ass to get to an aid station. I don't know. I mean, I got, I got a little worried about the frostbite there in the middle of the night because it got a lot colder than I was expecting. And, and and you're exposed up there over that divide and there's no shelter. And I was just before the sunset, I was with another guy. Uh, his name was Tony and I passed him and he was putting on these like negative 40 degree over boots over his running sneakers. And like my feet were wet and my shoes were wet and I like passed him. And then I was like going for a bit and I just kept thinking in my head, I'm like, is it really going to get that cold? Am I going to like lose my toes? I actually thought about you, Scotty. I was like, I'm going to turn into like Scotty. I'm going to be like, running down the trail, like convinced I have frostbite. (laughs) Um, so what were, what were the temperature, what was the temperature range while you guys were out there? Naomi. Uh, Um, I would say the first day it maybe got to 20 degrees when the sun was the highest, maybe. And then over that night, it probably, I mean like with wind chill, I don't know what wind chill was, but I'd say it got to negative 30 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, they said that the temperature read negative 28 degrees Fahrenheit, but that doesn't account for like wind chill. So negative so 28 was the official clocking of what the temperature was that night. And where, and, and where then were you the when next, it was negative 28? Were you up on top of the mountain? I was up on top of the mountain. Yeah, it was scary. It was cold. It was windy. It was exposed. <laughs> it was really cold. Um, was the, what was the trail like, um, Lourdes, was it, um, groomed? Was it a fast trail, slow trail? It was, it was groomed and it, uh, it was, I think it was fast what they would consider. It was quite packed. And, uh, there was one punchy section where you're going to punchy through and it was slow. Maybe that was a couple miles, but the rest of it was, you know, I thought very well groomed and not nearly as much like snowmobile traffic, except mm-hmm. for like the, the course is actually a lollipop. So it's a five mile. Then you go to the right and you make a huge loop around. Then you come back to the lollipop. So that five mile lollipop section to the finish had a lot more snowmobile, you know, so that was quite soft. But everything else, except for the punchy section, the other thing that this course is known for in other years because it's held late is overflow from melting. Can you explain to the listeners what overflow is? Because a lot of them, you know, they've never done a a winter ultra. So So overflow, from my understanding, is that you have, uh, you know, snow and ice. It melts and then it snow and ice forms again. But in between, there's a water layer. And so... If it starts melting again, you can you're walking across and you can punch right through. 
And so you'll get soaking wet. And so they really, you know, one of the things that they talk about is to make sure you have like large garbage bags in case there are, are, are overflows so that you can go through it and stay dry. Right, because if you if you don't year, have the, the the survival gear and you get soaking wet at minus twenty eight, you you got a problem. Right, and and it's happened. I mean, the guy that I was running with is from Fairbanks. He's done this race quite a lot. His name's Eric Roberts, and he said it happened to him last year. And he went in almost like to the hip, and he said it was free. Like you know, because I kept saying how cold it was, and he's like, "Oh, it's not as cold as if you fall through the ice." <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, it's all, it's all relative, right? You know, it's all like Biat kept saying, oh, it's not that cold. Well, sure. He goes out when it's minus 50 for 300 miles. So it's all kind of relative, like what you think is freezing cold. Right. And just for the listeners, when she says Biat, she's talking about Biat Jaggerlaner, the guy that in the last episode, we were, we had a segment about fantasy pacers. And I said, you know, if you could have anybody and you could, you know, he he would be my fantasy pacer just because that guy (laughs) is the most fascinating person in the fucking world. You know, I just, yeah. (laughs) Just so that everybody knows they're both like hanging out with my guy crush. (laughs) <laughs> and he's really nice and he's down to earth and you know he kept telling us oh don't worry and he's just chucking along you know yeah. doing what he does well it wasn't I, I thought about him at um i think it was at tascobia or something when or no I don't remember, one of the races there was like a discussion with edward sandor about bringing water versus freezing water and he kind of chimed in and he right. said something like well if it's only 80 miles i probably wouldn't bring anything i would just just melt snow or something and i was just like god He's like, he's like at a different <laughs> level, you know, like it's only 80 miles. Well, what the fuck, you know, what, what could go wrong? But Well, I, I assume that when you've done a thousand miles, then yeah, 80 miles is nothing. Yeah. Well, we're, we're all going to, we're going to talk about that and how we're all going to sign up for that later on. Um, <laughs> but okay. So now we're talking about food too. Now at these eight at the checkpoints, they have, what, what are these checkpoints like and what do they have? Naomi. Um, so the first one was like, like a picnic table on the side of the trail. Oh, that's a delightful. And it, and it, yeah. And it pretty much, j- it had, it had Jill Homer, but that was pretty much it. Well, that, that's <laughs> a lot right there. Jill's been on the show. Yeah. She's fun. I, I would, that would be very yeah. uplifting to me if I came upon a picnic table. I mean, if I came upon a picnic table in the middle of a winter ultra, like I'd be like, well, fuck this. And then I would get there and it'd be like, well, Jill is here. Well, that, that's a special treat, you know? So. But no food. No they nothing? they they did have Dory gummies. Those were very good. What's that? <laughs> like you know, D- D- Dora or no, like what that Disney character? Like gummies, like a gummy. Finding bear. Dory. Oh, Finding that's it. Dory. <laughs> oh, this is like a like a fish thing, like Nemo. Had, yeah. Not Dory. Yeah, yeah gummies. Finding Dory. Okay. So there were gu- so you could have a gummy in minus twenty eight, which is probably really <laughs> fun, right? Well, so then the the second, third, and fourth uh, aid station were all these like like cute little cabins off in the woods that had like wood stoves and bunks to sleep in, and each one of them had like the same kind of food, but then they also had like a special food. So like the first aid station had like baked potatoes, the second one had like meatball soup, and then the last one <laughs> didn't have oatmeal. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> And they have a very they have a very detailed menu of what they're going to have at each aid station, which so you, is why. So you know going into it, to what's going to be there? Exactly. Ah, and when you Except when you say they had the special item, and every, so everything else is just like normal ultra food. Yeah, like PBJs, chips, pretzels. They have Gatorade powder. They have like regular water and like a big one of those Gatorade things, but it's hot water, so you could put hot water into your pack if you wanted. Okay. And so you can't drop any gear anywhere, and you can't pick up any gear anywhere. And so you're on your own for your food unless you want to eat their stuff. Right. I I mean, I sort of got the feeling, well— they do, but there's still 20 miles in between aid stations. You know, it depends on how fast you're going. I mean, if you're running it, a la Terry Buck, and it's going to take <laughs> you, you know, two hours, okay, maybe you just need a few gummies. But if it's going to take you, you know, could take five, could take 10 hours if you're walking. If you three walking miles an hour, slow. that's that's a six-hour yeah. six thing. Like, I, you know, I need a sandwich. I need more than just a couple gummies. 
So you I, stocked you your know, sled with food. Right. I had food. Granted, a lot of it froze, but it's okay. You can eat it frozen. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, what, what kind of? So, do you have a special diet? Is that why you had food? No, I, not a special diet. Like, I'm not vegan or anything. It's just I like. There's just certain things I like to eat because I know it works well with my digestive system and usually doesn't cause problems. And that has been consistent, or has that changed from race to race? Because I, I just have had things. That no, it's like, been it's been pretty con- it's been pretty consistent for me for the last couple of years. Have you tried Cheetos? Um, no. Okay. I'm just saying that they do work. <laughs> all right. I've, I've never thrown up a I've Cheeto heard. in my life. <laughs> so have, then, they, have they picked you up as a sponsored athlete yet? No. No. <laughs> no. And, you know, now I, I got to get back on the eating right wagon pretty soon after. The problem with having too many races is you never get to, like, take a period where you just, like, live normal and go back to eating normal. Because you're just like, you're, well, well, I mean, especially in the slam, you're like, well, fuck, I'm going to be doing another race in two weeks. Why am I eating clean? But yeah. I got to get there at some point because there's no way to live. Um, all right. So what about you, Naomi? You just ate off the, tri- the aid stations? I probably ate, I think I counted, I ate seven peanut butter and jelly sandwiches over the course of the entire race. <laughs> seven PB&Js. Uh, and I ate about a pound of bacon at the second aid station. And then pretty much everything else was goo. Oh, and fruit leather. Dude, fruit leather is key. What is fruit leather? They're like, it's like kind of like fruit roll-up, but it's like not. It's like just like a piece of, it's called fruit leather. They're like a couple cents at the grocery store. And you just stick them in your pocket, and they're just—they're amazing, man. I didn't—I wasn't expecting them to be that good, but they saved me up going up over that pass. I've never even heard of this before. I'll have to try it. Um, and is, yeah. is this also a run, ski, and bike? Yeah, it's—it's it's pretty much all bike. So there was like ninety, ninety. They only—they only allow ninety racers, and there was about fifteen runners, probably less actually than fifteen. Um, and then, you know, there's never really a big skier scene, but there was a pretty big skier scene at this race. It's probably about 15 skiers, 15 runners, which would put it at like 60 bikers. And do they, is it a lottery? Yeah, t- kind of. Yeah. I think it's a lottery. Lord but they, you know? So they had to. Uh, yes, it's a lottery. You put your name in and then they have a certain amount of slots for each of the divisions. And then depending on the division, they create a wait list. And as if people drop from that division, then people on the wait list for the specific division bump up. Okay. Got it. But it's definitely, it's definitely, I say three quarter bikers and the last quarter is split. So it's like an eighth skiers and an eighth runners. And you guys or walkers. As, do you, huh? do you all start together? Yes, everyone starts together. Okay, so then you'd never see those the fir- bikes again. Yeah, the first biker finished in eight hours. Oh, my God. No, yeah, we actually, we did see bikers. There were some bikers that were, you know, taking it pretty pretty easy. And, well, yeah, there's like, that you, one you, biker. You'd catch, them, you'd, catch them, <laughs> you'd catch them at the aid stations, right, if they were sleeping. Some of them slept. So then logistically, you guys, obviously, you have to fly to Fairbanks. Right. And is that really expensive? I used points, so it wasn't too bad. Nine. Mine was like 400 bucks. Oh, that's not bad. From Tahoe? Yeah, from Reno. Oh, that's not bad at all. And then once you're there, then do you get a hotel or do you stay in a cabin? What, what, what's the lodging like there? We stayed I there. stayed in a hotel. Yeah. We stayed at like an extended stay um, because we wanted a full kitchen so we could cook. Something we learned from the Arrowhead, which didn't even have microwaves in the hotel room. <laughs> well, but there was a buffet downstairs. Yeah, but I like to make my own food. Oh, see, now we're learning a lot about Lorda. She likes to, she likes to have <laughs> her own food. She's very particular. <laughs> she's not on a special diet, yeah. but she's very particular. Yeah. Yes, it's 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 uh, that's good way to put it. All right, so the, the race, uh, if you end it on a Monday, then when does it start? On Friday or Saturday? Sunday. It starts on. Why does it's it start? only it's a it's a forty hour cutoff. Okay, forty hours, hundred miles starts on a Sunday. What time? 
8 a.m. Okay. And it's about a, about an hour drive. Like in the morning, you it's about an hour drive to the trailhead okay. from Fairbanks. And then and it starts and ends at the same place, obviously. If it's a lollipop, right? Yeah. So then, was Lourdes waiting for you, Naomi, when you finished? Oh yeah, she was waiting for like four. Yeah, exactly four hours. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nice. Yeah. That was nice. Um, <laughs> all right. So what, did you guys start the race together? Did you have a plan in terms of like sticking together versus not sticking together? Walk me through that a little bit, uh, Lourdes. Um, yeah, no, there was no plan because Naomi's like, I'm doing my own thing. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was like, okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> so, so look- no, it, no, I mean, we were, you know, I had a sled and she didn't. So, you know, we didn't really figure, I figured we'd be kind of back and forth a bit, you know, just because that's kind of what, especially with only 15 people, you know, normally you kind of get into a groove and you're kind of back and forth. I know she's a lot younger, less than half my age. And so I figured, you know, let her go. And, and you have to kind of, I think something Naomi learned at Arrowhead was that you have to do your own thing. These are long races with a long amount of time. At some point you'll see people, you'll go back and forth and eventually you get into a groove and there's somebody hopefully maybe around your pace that you'll end up with, or you'll be back and forth with them. But it's very hard, I think, to put the pressure on someone to stay with you the entire time you know, if you want to get to the finish, you kind of at some point have to do your own thing. Well, let's back up on that a little bit and, and let's talk about Arrowhead because then you guys did Arrowhead. It was the two of you and then Lester. And so right. like Naomi, going into Arrowhead, did you guys have a plan of sticking together? Or did you say the same thing? I'm going to do my own thing. Um. So, no, we did not have a plan of sticking together during the Arrowhead either. Um. But we kind of, so like there's a the airhead. So I'll just say that like I'm young and I and I don't race very much because I don't really like racing. I really only like racing winter ultras, and so I'm just I have so much to learn. Like I'm just such a novice at ultras. Like I don't even know what. Like <laughs> I show up and I'm just like hopefully my pain tolerance is good enough to finish this. Um, <laughs> and uh, so yeah, so at the airhead, I was just you know, I feel like I was. I was trying to lean on the knowledge that Lester and Lourdes had from like their years of ultra experience. And I was like, well, I'll just, I'll just do what they do and hope that it works for me. And so I was just trying to stick with them. And I think that's why, like, there was no, there was no set word that we were going to stick together. It was just, you know, I should have run my own race. It's pretty much the, the gist. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's curious to me because, you know, I ran with Tim and, for, you know, like in my mind going into the race, like if I went, if I went to this race with you, let's say, and, or both of you, and we all, let's say we all did Tuscobia next year in my mind, I would be thinking, well, I want to go three and a half miles an hour for the first 80 miles. And if we're around three and a half miles an hour, I'm going to stick together. And if, and if something happens that someone's lagging behind or someone's pushing the pace too much, I might have a conversation with them, but I would try to stick together, you know? Um, but as, as you know, in all these races, I eventually had to break up with whoever I was with, you know, for whatever reason that might be. Um, but I think that I just liked having someone around because I I liked the idea of being able to, to say help and someone would hear me, (laughs) you know, (laughs) like it's weird. Well, it's just that idea. It's just so that, and I'm the same way. It's just the idea of there's somebody else there just in case you're not chatting the whole time and talking the whole time, but there's somebody in the vicinity, even if you can't maybe see them for a minute, somebody stops to take a dump, somebody goes ahead, the next person catches up that, you know, a lot of times if you're having a a low point, if there's somebody there, it kind of pushes you up out of it and vice versa. Then maybe they're having a low point because you're feeling strong. Then you push them through. It's nice having that give and take a bit. The problem with the ultras is if you're, behind and you catch somebody the reality is is that you're stronger than they are so eventually you're going to move ahead probably yeah so you can you, you 
Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I'm with you. And like, but from, from my standpoint, like, let's say I'm running along and then I catch up to you, Lourdes, my reaction would be, all right, I'm going to hang with her for a while. And if right. she's not going up to my speed at some point, I'm going to leave her behind. But if I feel yeah. pretty, I mean, I would rather go a tiny bit slower and have company than yes. make time and be alone, you know? Right. To, exactly. To, to some I'm, extent. I'm totally, yeah, I'm totally the same. And I've, I'm totally the same. And I've done that for other people. And I'm sure other people have done that for me at times. Yeah. But then like, it, like for example, in Tuscobia, then when I woke up and I looked at the clock and thought about it and knew that I needed to finish, that's when I just said, Hey, yep. listen, here's the plan. This is what I'm doing. I'm setting the pace. Keep right. up with me. I'm not looking back, you know, and just exactly. Went, took off. Well, it's all good. Oh, it's all good. As long as you're going to make it to the finish. Right. And, and I don't care about being first, second, third, fourth, fifth. Like as long as I'm going to finish and I have enough time, I'll crawl to the finish. I could care less really about the time. Mm -hmm. And I'd rather help somebody else get to the finish if I'm the stronger one, just like I would hope somebody else would drag my ass there if they were stronger, right? Right. So well, it's not like I'm not in this to win it or anything. I'm in it to, to make it to the finish and to experience Right. Experience. Well, and and, and right. it get, sometimes it gets scary out there. But I mean, if, if I was at minus 28 yep. and I was by myself going over some pass and I would be scared, you know, I mean, yeah, that's just me. Obviously, you guys are tougher than I am. Um, <laughs> oh, no, we were not alone. I, 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 I linked up with Tony for the night. I told him I was scared. That's I was like, can we just stick stick together through the night? I'm like. Lourdes and Eric were the people in front of us and they were hours ahead of us. And the people behind us were hours behind us. I was like, if anything happens out here, like I'm dead. <laughs> so and you, Eric you and I someone. had linked up. A, yeah. Eric, Eric and I had linked up a bit earlier when we came into the second checkpoint, my tracker wasn't working. And they asked because we came in together and we basically were leaving together. He's like, okay, well you guys are just going to stick together. Right. And I was, I felt kind of bad. I was like, well, you know, don't feel like you have to, I'm sure they'll get it working. And, and they did by the next checkpoint, but, um, you know, but then we were just like, yeah. And so we just kind of pushed and pulled together. And the only reason I caught, cause he and Biot had gone ahead. The only reason I caught him was cause I rode like a mile and a half hill down. <laughs> yeah, what was this now? I saw this on social media. Someone that was, didn't want to ride their sled down the hill. What was that all about? Well, I, I guess apparently at, at this one, you know, people weren't doing that. And I, I one of the early hills I tried, but it, the problem was is that the downhills were so gradual. They weren't like Arrowhead where they're straight down. Right. Because at Arrowhead, you're going straight up and straight down, but they're short. These were long, either ups or not even that, but really long, long, gradual, gradual downs, which, to tell you the truth, was perfect because you couldn't even feel the sled behind you. It was like you were just running with a little pack mm -hmm. because the sled was just going along because it was just just that much down. Right. L let me um, just let me just jump in and tell the listener what we're talking about here is winter ultras yeah. with a sled getting on the sled and riding it down the hill. And now it, at, at Tuscobia 160, I told Tim that looked like a really bad idea and I didn't want to do it because I thought it was going to hurt right. my back and it was going to fuck up my sled. And then at Arrowhead, I, I insisted I wasn't going to ride the hills either. And Sue was just like, you're going to ride the hills. You're stupid. You're going to ride the hills. And the first time I did it, then I was addicted. So right. and, and now oh, yeah, it, it almost makes it like – worth being there oh, once yeah. you get used to it <laughs> except like at arrowhead then you'd get like the, the snow flying up in your face or you'd go so fast that and and like you'd stop steering because you know it's like you're counter steering it's almost like doing like a flight simulator where you go just a little bit to the left and you just fly yeah. over and, then, and eventually you just have vertigo and you don't know what the fuck's going on and you just close your eyes and hope you don't run into a tree um <laughs> But, now, but the sleds, the sleds are really good about finding a track. They so are. as long as somebody else has sledded the hill already, you're you, you are pretty good. And when you get close to the side, you pretty much dump over anyway. Right. So at this yeah. race, is there a rule about that? Is it encouraged? Is it prohibited? Do you not know? You just well, just I don't know. It? I just I never. I I mean I. I, I, I have a feeling that apparently I don't think it's prohibited. They didn't DNF me, and everybody knows. 
you know, especially because I was screaming because it was like I started, I didn't realize how long it, it was like a mile and a half. <laughs> and I was like, what? Well, I had some of those then, at Arrowhead where like you ride it and then you go up and then if you just push your poles in a little bit and you push, then you go right. over the next one and then it's again. like fucking right. bonus hill, you know? But, no, I mean, this thing was probably three to four times longer than anything at Arrowhead. And I mean, it was down. Because you were going from a high point. Like when we drove to the trailhead, we basically drove up hill the whole way. And then we went back down and like we ran down into a valley. So then it kind of got flat. So I got off the sled and I was going along. And then there was a much shorter, much more like Arrowhead, super steep. And I went and I got on that one. But at the end of it, it was like a really sharp, bright turn onto a river. And so I had to fishtail the sled. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, there's, so, you know, uh, several people were around and witnessed my, um, descent that was pretty quick. And I, that's where I caught up to a bunch of people. <laughs> so now, that's where she so, lost me. yeah, well, cheating, this is what I'm thinking is, <laughs> so like after Arrowhead, I would from time to time, just walking around, I would see a hill and I would think, Ooh, this is rideable, you know, like just oh, like absolutely. That, that, that was stuck in my head. That was my reaction to certain hills. So now Naomi, you're back there. You, you got no sled. You got a light pack. <laughs> At what point do you, yeah, are let, you like, Oh, I'm kind of fucked here. I got no sled. Yeah. Let me just tell you that I said, fuck you, Lourdes out loud <laughs> on the trail <laughs> because I had her in my sights. Like, you know, I was like behind her, but I could see her on the trail. And, uh, and I was following her footprints cause she had these like brand new hokas. So they were like the crispest footprints in the snow. <laughs> she was the only one wearing hokas. So I just follow them. And that was like kind of how I passed the time following her hoka prints. And then all of a sudden they'd disappear <laughs> and I'd be like, Oh, she fucking sledded this hill. That bitch. <laughs> and I'd like, you know, I'd like run down the hill and it would take me forever. And then all of a sudden I'd see like some squiggly lines in the snow <laughs> and then her footprints would pick back up and I'd be like, <laughs> Oh, she's running again. And then a few seconds later, you know, her footprints would disappear. And yeah, I was like, for for no other reason than to ride that one mile and a half long downhill, <laughs> I would bring a sled. Oh, so much so, awesome. so much snow that the Tony, the guy that I, I walked up over the pass with and spent the night out there with, he had a sled. And I kept being like, Tony, if any of these hills are rideable on the downhill... Me and you are getting in the sled together. And we're going down. <laughs> no, he's uh, that. I think I know who that is. That's he's an Alaska guy, right? Yeah, yeah. So did, did he? He didn't ride any of the hills. No, he was like he kept being like he's like you can ride my sled, but I'm not going to ride in it. And I was like, what are you talking about? You're going to let me take your sled? You're going to drag your sled out here and let me take it down the hill? <laughs> so like, wh why wasn't score. he riding down the hills? <laughs> what was his reasoning? I don't, I don't think that people who don't do Arrowhead ride their sleds ever. It's just like you guys, like, you know, before we went to Arrowhead, we were like, no way. I'm never going to ride down a hill on my sled. And then and you do I it. At Arrowhead, I didn't even, I didn't ride till the, the 40 mile section. Those were the, and because we were in the dark going into, you know, the lake, right. Right. Uh, across the lake. And it was Carrie, uh, Carrie came coming came by and Lester and I were running down the hill and she comes right now. She's like, you gotta ride the hills. And she like <laughs> goes around the corner and we're like, damn. And I looked at Lester and I was like, you want to ride? And he's like, well, not in the dark. I'm like, okay, no, me neither. Let's, let's do You know, maybe the next section. Cause we knew we were going to do that in the day. Like if you're going to start riding the hills, like I'd rather start in the daylight. Well, when you, when you were in the, like, so you can see when you were in the hilly section, I don't know. Um, it was snowing when I was there. Right. And it was snowing pretty it was intensely. It was, yeah, and it, it, it was hard to ride because you couldn't see. You with were a like headlamp, blinded. it was really hard to see what was going on. Like, you didn't I, – I, I remember calling my wife and saying, am I still even on the trail? Because, like, I, I, I couldn't see anything, really, except yeah. lots of snowflakes and, and I was climbing. But it was really fun to ride down those hills in those situations, too, because you couldn't see a fucking thing. You had no idea how far down the hill went. You know, when is this going to no. end? I don't know. Just whatever. My favorite hill was the one that sh shot you down and then shot you over the bridge. Yeah, but you got to be really careful because I kept thinking I'm going to hit the pole on this bridge. Yeah, Lester did, but I, I flew right <laughs> over. 
<laughs> it's all about the talent. Yeah. Well, so you have some good sledding hills, and those come in handy during this race. And then what about Bayat? He doesn't sled? No, I'm pretty sure he doesn't sled. He didn't say – well, I mean, he didn't say, but I have a feeling he's – I don't know. Non-sledder? When he's, he's got, like – when he's got like legs of steel from walking hundreds of thousands yeah, of miles, I'm, I'm pretty sure he doesn't need to sled. I'm pretty sure he didn't run a step of it either. Ugh, I believe that. We're gonna have to find out. I mean that that dude was like, I mean he was. I, I never saw him actually. Maybe trot. No, that's not true. He was trotting like in the beginning, like the first downhills. That it was a long, and I thought maybe I could ride it, so I was trying to ride it. And so, but I had to push with my hands, and I'm like, this isn't rideable. And he came trotting by, and he's like. And he's like, wait till later, they get steeper. <laughs> so, Maybe he does ride it then. Yeah, so he didn't look yeah. at you and say, why are you riding on your sled, cheater? No, yeah, no, no, no. But he wasn't really a, I, I a think he was. Either. I think he was more, uh, it seemed like he was more amused by the whole thing. We're going to have to, we're going <laughs> like, to have to get this into idiot. this at some point. Because it, it, it doesn't, doesn't seem to add up that only, only the people that went to Arrowhead are riding on their sleds. That's well, it. at Susitna... It's the sitting there. There's it's flat. What are you going to ride down? Right. Well, Tuscopia is like nothing... that too. There's like maybe three hills in the entire race that you could ride on. Well, and it depends on the conditions, right? Like these trails were hard packed, so they were pretty rideable. But if you have soft, soft, fluffy snow, yeah. it may not be as rideable. You see what I'm saying? Sure, sure. So. Uh- so Naomi's at a, another disadvantage because she doesn't have a sled that she can ride on, which puts right. her further behind. And Tony doesn't want to ride on his sled. Um, <laughs> so did did you end up running the rest of the race with Tony? How does that how does that pan out? Um. So no, Tony and I just said we were going to run together through the night to get to the third aid station for safety reasons. Um. And we talked a little bit before it got so cold, but when it got when it gets that cold, like you have your buff on and your, your hoods down and like all the only thing visible is your eyes. You can't even talk. This is the minus yourself. 28 night is what we're talking about. Yeah. Yeah. So when we got to that aid station, um, Tony wanted to, I mean, Tony, Tony's an ITI guy. So they sleep. The, the when people, she says those, ITI, she means the Iditarod trail invitational, the 350,000 mile race. Go ahead. Yeah. So they sleep like all these guys sleep because they just, they know what they need and they need sleep. So he fell asleep at the, the third aid station and I kept going <clears throat> and he didn't catch me till like the final seven miles, um, of the race. Do you know how long he but slept I, for? I don't think very long, like maybe an hour or two, but he, I think he also, I mean, he was really cold. Like he was having a lot of trouble staying warm. So I think he stopped at all the medical tents and I didn't to warm up. Um, but no, I ran with this guy, Fred for a bit at the second half and he was like, he was in like a t-shirt and in like spandex <laughs> pants <laughs> and he was really, really fast. He just had a camel back on and he had like slept, you know, probably like, you know, four or five or six hours at that, that third aid station because it was so cold outside that he needed to like get warm. And so he tried to walk with me a bit in the morning and, uh, I was just going too slow for him to stay warm. <laughs> so he had to run. So, and then what about Crazy. you, Lourdes? How much time did you spend with people and who did you spend time with? Uh, I was, you know, pretty much with Eric from the time I caught them down that really big hill. It's probably about mile 30 or so. He and I, um, Eric is from there, from Fairbanks. Well, no, he's from New Jersey, but he's living in Fairbanks Station there. He's in the Army. And he just knew a lot about the trails and he was just giving me all sorts of great information. And we were just going along, you know, really well. We didn't really have a pack to stay together, but we were getting in and out of the aid stations, you know, at the same time. Uh, the one aid station, I guess, aid station three, he had some pretty bad blisters. And we had just, we'd, we went over the pass. And just as we got to the very top of the pass was when the Aurora Borealis started. And it was amazing. And so we probably wasted a good 20 minutes, you know, watching, then going, then watching, then going, then watching, then going. And, I mean, I was grateful to have them because it was super cold. And I was like, okay, wow, that's great. And then I'd put my head down and start going. And um, so he would call out to me, like, look to your left, look to your right. Because, you know, I guess he's from there and he's seen them. But at the same time, I think he was enjoying the fact that 
I was enjoying the scenery so much. And uh, so, so anyways, we got into that aid station and he had some pretty bad blisters and some issues with his feet. And, you know, he's like, I'm really sorry. You can go ahead. But, you know, to tell you the truth, I, you know, I think I'm kind of like you. I, I was enjoying his company and I was enjoying all the information that he was giving me. And I was like, whatever, I don't care. I'm like, I looked at the time and we had so much time. I was way ahead of where I thought I would have been. And I was like, you know, there were times when he was pushing me and times I think, I think when I was pushing him, you know, so we, I felt like we were working together and I was like, it was worth it to me to spend an extra hour. I just took off a lot of my clothes and dried it and uh, just hung out there really ate slowly and let my, my stomach settle, which might've been good because I didn't get any sort of stomach upset or anything during this race. And, uh, and then we left there together and we, we pretty much, you know, we, you know, there was a couple of times that I stopped in a, in the medical tents. I did stop cause I would have to get hot hands or change a layer or do whatever. And he didn't have to stop, but he was willing to stop there with me. And so, you know, I just kind of returned the favor and then we ended up together, like pretty much till the end, we, we crossed the finish together. Granted, I yelled, I was like, come on, hurry up. Cause I wanted to get like, while we were there, you know, might as well not let it get to 33 hours, but. So you guys got to see the Northern Lights. Yes. And I've never seen that before. Had you guys seen it before? I've seen it here in Calgary, but not to the extent. Naomi? I had never seen it. Um, was, was it, like, super awesome? Someone told me once that it looks better in a picture than it does live. I don't know why that's in my head somewhere. Is that true or... You know, I think it depends on when it's happening. Like we got really lucky. Well, we got really unlucky, but also really lucky. There was not a single cloud in the sky. Um, and it was also like the Aurora Borealis like shifts like north and south, like where it's the most vibrant. And it was that day, that night, it was supposed to be the most vibrant right where we were. Um, so we got really lucky with the conditions in the sense that the, there was not a cloud in the sky. And it was like the, the Aurora Borealis was positioned directly above us. Um, it was amazing. I mean, it, they danced and they all night, all night, but, um, the drawback to having such a clear night was that we, there was no cloud coverage. So even though it did get maybe 20 degrees during that day, um, the second the sun set, the heat wasn't trapped in. And so it like the temps plummeted so quickly, like the second the sun set, it went from like, like 10 degrees, to like negative 10 degrees, like in an hour. <laughs> So where were you when the, was it the same for you, Lourdes, same area? Yeah. Yeah. We were directly up on the, like we were right at, in fact, we hit the, there was a little sign that said halfway point. And so we were right at the very, very top of the pass and we look up and it was like nothing. I, I, it was more than I could have ever imagined. It was just like, like if you have you have a kid with two hands full of paint and they're going like this with like hand paints, you know, and swirling it around. It was just I mean, I was just in awe, but I was so fucking cold. I couldn't get my phone out to like take a picture of it. And and I didn't want to like I wanted to live the moment because I know like maybe I'll never see it again. But in my mind's eye, it's there because I really just looked at it. Like it was, and then the rest of the night it would sort of come and go. And it, sometimes it was in front of you. Sometimes it was to the left. Sometimes it arced over and it was just, it was just changing all the time. And it's up there all night long. Well, no, like I said, like it comes and goes or oh, okay. well, at least from what I saw, it seemed like it kind of came and w- like it would be there and it would be spectacular and you'd watch it for a while and then you'd start going and then you'd look up and maybe that had faded, but something else was bright and, and something else was moving and, So it went, you know, back and forth. So what was the um, total time that you were out on the course, Lourdes? Uh, We were, our total time out on the course was like 350, I'm sorry, 32, like 56 or so. So you're about eight hours shy of the cutoff. You had plenty of time. Right. And And then, and Eric was wearing a Garmin that was pausing and he said our running time. So our moving time was 30 hours and 16 minutes. And then what about you, Naomi? What was your finish time? I finished in 36 hours and 50 minutes. Yeah. And uh, what was the 
people always want to know, like, what what's the swag? What do they give you? <laughs> a belt buckle. Nice. I saw I saw a, cop, a picture of the belt buckle. Yeah, they gave us like a a shirt and a beanie. Um, you know, the shirt's kind of grown on me, Lourdes. Like at first, you look at it and you're like, "Are you freaking kidding me?" <laughs> it's like it's like a shirt hoodie. Yeah, and it doesn't even say well, White Mountain on it. It just says like WM. You're like, "Well, I hope everyone knows what WM <laughs> is." <laughs> um, <laughs> well, the belt buckle is very then, creative too. It's, it has a picture of a skier and a runner and a biker with a mountain, and it says. White Mountain 100. WM. Yeah, WM. Nope, it says WM 100. <laughs> I sort of, picture, but I sort right? of felt like, but the biker should have been in the front. <laughs> <laughs> Seems to me. <laughs> and is this beanie, is it a finisher's beanie? No, no it's just, it's just, uh, like, uh, really unflattering on a woman. <laughs> She's wearing it right now. She says she's going to wear it during the interview. Winter yeah, yeah. Ultra is really, they're really not known for their swag. Like, uh, Tuscobia, they just, you just get a beanie. That's it. Well, and I got a great headband at Arrowhead, but when I washed it, all the words came. Well, it, it still says Arrowhead, but I think, like, most of it came off. This was, it was your finisher's just like, headband? Yeah, because it wasn't, like, sewn on there. It's just, like, you know, like an iron-on. So yeah. when you wash it, it just comes off. I just put my, I bought two of those regular hats and then I, I take them, my finisher hat. And I put in my, I call it my douche display. Cause it's just like <laughs> all the awards and things in the corner of my room. Well, like if you guys came to do the podcast live, you have to walk by it all on your way in. So oh. it's kind of like, Hey, there's my arrowhead trophy. Come on in. Let me talk to you. Um, but yeah, so I, I just didn't want it to get rubbed off either. It's I'm like worried about that. So so, so and you'll you never oh, you sent a trophy. So you won't you wear it? No, I don't. I don't wear it. I just leave it in the thing. I bought two hats that just say Arrowhead one thirty five. That they're not the finisher ones. Cause, I mean, they're they're exactly right. the same, but they don't have finisher on it. And I wear those all the time. Well, couldn't you take one of those to like a little sewing lady and have her embroider finisher on it? Yeah, I guess I could. But I mean, I'll just go back and get another one next year, right? Well, there you go. See, because we're all going to do it next year, right? Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Nobody's saying anything. Yeah, I was going to say, I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I would, I mean, if Lester goes back, I'll, I'll definitely go back for him because, you know, I, I, you know, I know he really wanted to finish it, but there's also, you know, other, it's like even regular ultras, like there's so many out there. I would love to go back to Arrowhead though, because. I do feel, and this is my own personal experience with it, was that I was terrified, like literally legit terrified going into it. Because when I did Susitna, I went with a friend named Karen and it was our pact to stay together. And we did, you know, we really stayed together and we did it together. But this time I sort of felt like, okay, well, all the stuff I learned there I can use here. So I'm really going to try to do this by myself. And I was like pretty terrified. Like, and so I, I realized, um, in the weeks after when I was reading all the beautiful race reports that everybody else had written that I missed something out there in the, ex like, I didn't, like, I was so shut down mentally just doing what I had to do to get through that. I don't know that I really like, I mean, I know there are parts of it that I enjoyed, but you know what I mean? Sometimes I sort of felt like things were just flying by and I was just too on task. And so I really told myself with white mountain that I wasn't going to do like, I, I really went there to experience it and to do it and to enjoy it. And, and to be fair, I knew that I would like the scenery and everything more in the mountains that I'd want to stop and look around and take a couple. I didn't even take a picture at Arrowhead. Like I just was so scared yeah, there, there's something about that race that's that is it's just scary to me. I, I think it's just well, it's a lot of this. The distance between aid stations there is, you know, like when I read Lisa's race report and it, she said it took her 24 hours to go that 43 mile section. I mean, that's a long, long time. Like I thought it took me a long time, and I mean that's that's just a long, long time yeah. to be out there and to be by yourself and to be self sustained. 
And yes, I take all that mandatory gear, but I don't want to use any of it. Oh, like yeah. I don't want a baby and I don't want to do a sleeping bag and I don't want to melt water and God, like, no. like I, I need to, but I, that's the thing is like, I need to get to the point like where if I'm going to continue doing these, I, I learned to do that and I want to do it. But well, at this right. point I'm still not there yet. Yeah, I mean, Naomi sent me a message about, I think you said like that I should sign up for the, the Scobia 350. And I, just, I said, I'm not ready to do that because I've never used my sleeping bag. I've never used my stove. The ITI 350. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you said the Discobia yeah. 350. Oh, sorry. ITI, yeah, Discobia 350. That would be, yeah. that'd be terrible. That'd be like back, back, <laughs> back and forth uh, flat course. <laughs> Although there's a lot of bars Four on that times. course. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I, I, you know, I need more experience, and I need to, I need to use my camping gear. And the problem is, we had a shitty winter here. I mean, I was talking right. to Naomi about they got like nine hundred forty three feet of snow, and we got like two all winter. It was, right, it was the worst right. winter ever. But, um, but, but but one thing I'm learning about these winter ultras is that as much as whatever the courses and whatever, it's really about the the people. Like the one thing that I loved reading was that. Even though maybe I didn't meet that person particularly, they would talk about other people. Like I felt like I, whether on the trail or at breakfast, the breakfast after the race meeting, I met so many of the people and everybody knows each other. So it's like I want to go back for that. I want to go back for the people that are in it, not necessarily for the course. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, I mean, ultra runners are a different kind of people. And winter ultra runners are the best parts of that different kind of people. And yeah, it's a whole another subset. Yeah, it's like a, in, you know, I, I felt it with these people that I did the slam with, you know, like the six of us. Yes. We have this bond, you know, forever. And it's just like so crazy. But, you know, we all know each other and, you know, you're kind of like family and you may be saving someone's life out there. And, you know, it's just, I don't know. Right. Winter people are different. They sure are. I think. Oh, um, I absolutely agree. No, yeah. I loved reading all the reports. I mean, it. I was like in tears when I read your all's reports on the active epica and how you guys, you know, made it through and made it to the order and all of that. I was just, and I didn't even know, like, you know, maybe I met them or said hi to them, but I there was there was a part I remember reading Daniel Slater, I believe his name was. Yep. yep. I remember reading his race report at Arrowhead and. I had tears at the end because everything he wrote was my experience. Mm -hmm. And it was just so wonderful to know that, you know, maybe I can't put it into words, but somebody else could. Yeah, you want you want to hear something though about that guy? It's funny is that the in the first race of the Slam in Tuscobia, at the eighty mile turnaround, he quit last year. I quit last year. I didn't think yeah. about quitting. He was hurting really bad at that turnaround. And uh -oh. and and we me and Tim geared up to leave and he was like right. like puttering around and he wasn't completely committed to leaving or whatever. And I just looked at him like, What the fuck are you doing? Get come on, you have to go. You got time, but you know, like like yell at him right. to leave and then he's like, All right, fine. You know, I have like you you can run with us and, and we didn't wait for him. He right. just he, he was all by himself. But you know, so then he come and just to think back to that was you know, 300 miles earlier in the slam, you know, right. he could have just as easily dropped out of that race. You know, if me and Tim right. wouldn't have started to right. push him out of that aid station. So and maybe it was your coaxing that that's right. That pushed him out. Could have been. Like, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah. Well, you I mean, we'll sort of, know. you know, right. But that, I mean, that's the kind of thing that winter people do, you know, it's just yeah. different. And it wasn't like, uh, I want to beat this guy, so I better get out of here fast. It was, I want more people out there. I want us all to, f I mean, we all want each other to finish, you know, and it's. Right. Yeah. It's unusual. So, yes, I think you should come back to Arrowhead. And I, I don't know. <laughs> Arrowhead feels different than any other race I've been to, just in terms of organization and the pre-race meeting and just the, the the history and, the you know, the vibe there. It just seems different. I don't know. Yeah. Why. Did it seem different than Yeah, it was White definitely, Mountain? I felt like, um, I, don't, I, I thought it was pretty, you know, it was pretty technical, and like Naomi said, I, I do sort of feel like they cater maybe a little bit more to the bikers. But it's also a very Alaska group. Like, there was maybe, I don't know, maybe 10 people who didn't live in Alaska who were running, or, or whether biking, skiing, 
or running. Mm -hmm. So it really is an Alaska group. And you could see that like when we were in line, everybody was coming in. Oh, hey, like they all knew each other. And a lot of the people literally had found out within the last week that they were doing it. Yeah. Like, like Bayat, he, that was a last minute decision by him. Right. Like you have to be pretty local. I mean, I know they're not local, but they were in Alaska anyway. Yeah. It's like a whole nother world. The Alaska, and, you know, and then I say to my wife, you know, I just, I showed her the pictures. I was like, you know, this would probably be kind of fun. And she just doesn't want me to go to Alaska. She's afraid if I go to Alaska that I'm never going to come back. <laughs> oh, you will. Cause town's kind of gross. Oh, you'll come back. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. All right. So, now you guys got this behind you. This is an Iditarod qualifier. Arrowhead's an Iditarod qualifier. Sitna was an Iditarod qualifier. Is that the next step? Is that what you're going to do next? Or what's your plan, your winter running plan? We'll just talk winter running. Maybe we'll start with Naomi. Uh, no. <laughs> um, I'm, not, I'm definitely not ready for the ITI. Uh, honestly, and I don't even know if I want to do the ITI. Um, I think I'd probably start with the Idita sport. Uh, it's like, you know, I, it's like a, a little smaller of a race. They like mark the course, um, and they offer a 200 mile race. Th- that would be a good introduction, I think. And it's cheap. It's like the 200 mile race is like $200. I shouldn't be saying this. Like everyone's going to register and I'm going to like not get in now. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, but every, yeah, everyone's going to say, you know what, Naomi, I'm sure that there, I mean, everybody's at their computer right now getting to, to sign up for the 200 mile Alaska. I did a sport. It's going to, it's going to be a fucking rush. It's going to be like the next, you know, <laughs> Western States. <laughs> just like, it's only $200. Lottery. Yeah. Except you got to fly to Alaska. Man. It's 200 miles. It's, you know, all right. Is that the one yeah. that, um, That's a- Jorge did Wendy's boyfriend? Wendy Jones? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, but he did the, I think he was in the thousand mile. Okay. But yeah, so um, I think that would be my next, my next step, but I don't know if that's going to happen next year. Lourdes and I had, had tossed around the idea of doing the Robbie. Um, I know you and I had talked about it too, uh, Scotty, yes. but going over to Finland and doing the, the, the Finland race. Yeah, um, my- that might be like the, that'd probably be the I think that would be the best next step because like if you're going to do these shorter distance winter ultras, you should get them all out of your system before you go to the longer ones, because then the longer ones just trap you. And then you never leave <laughs> the next that. thing you know, you're doing 350 and then the next time you're doing a thousand and then, and then you're sleeping at aid stations in the 100 milers, you know, <laughs> <laughs> not, and then you're just like, I'm not, I don't ride down the Hills. What are you talking about? I'm not doing that. <laughs> yeah. But then there's also the Yukon Arctic ultra. Yeah, but, you know, that is, you know, it's so expensive. I mean, $1,500 for 100 miles, to tell you the truth, that's why I did the sitting in the first place. It was because the sitting was like 200 bucks. I just, I cannot, and that's part of my problem with the Iditarod. I can't wrap my head around, you know, $1,000 for the entry fee when I'm taking everything I need. Like, you're going to give me a couple gummies and I'm paying 1000 bucks. Like, that's... Yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a steep, steep thing to pay. That's for sure. It's steep, and and it you know I at least if I go to Finland, I get a holiday out of it. You know what I mean? Yeah, but I mean it's going to cost you more than a thousand bucks to go to Finland. That can't yeah, but cheap. I got a holiday, and I'm enjoying it. You do a holiday in Alaska, you know, just and go a little slower. Well, yeah, you can make but like, it's like you haven't been to Alaska. I'm yeah, telling that's you, true. other than the woods, you pretty much want to leave. And the snow, and the mountains, and the cold. <laughs> Right. And the people. And the northern lights and the moose and the people. But you do all that during your race. So then you don't want to, then like, I didn't even want to leave the hotel afterwards because I had been so cold for two days. <laughs> <laughs> we did. We did. We left. We drove south to the North Pole and we enjoyed it. And then we were like, okay, we're done. You drove south Let's go back to, the hotel. to the North Pole? Yeah. You went to the North we Pole? Were north of it. Yeah. Yeah, and North Pole, not- Alaska. Wow. It's not the actual North Pole. Oh, so it's a city called North Pole. Well, it was, they thought it was the North Pole, but, you know, Canada hadn't been discovered yet or something. I don't know, weird. It was, <laughs> it's, it's, it's an odd story. 
I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't even want to know the details. It, it's already too funny. <laughs> it's not the North Pole. They thought it was the North Pole. They, but there was something north of it, yeah. which makes it probably not, pretty right. easy to say that's not the North Pole if there's something north of it. But, but that's the thing. If you're at the North Pole, there's something north in the North Pole, right? No. no. <laughs> if you're at the North Pole, yeah, everything is south of you. Yeah, but it's not like you're standing on top of a mountain and everything's like downhill. You're like standing on flat ground and like looking in all directions is flat. And you're like, I don't even know if I'm at the North Pole. <laughs> right, but let's say that you're at the North Pole. And let's say that we could prove that you're at the North Pole. Every direction that you go is south. Should be down. <laughs> it's south, right. yeah. So they should have I'd like to. Were... Yeah. God, we need someone That's true. that knows science on the show to like explain this to us. It's very interesting. So, if you stand at the North Pole with a compass, it always points south. Yeah, that's true. All right, so so Naomi's not going to Arrowhead, and she's not going to Tuscolia. She's not coming back to the Midwest. Oh, she'll go. This is what she's saying now. Okay, we'll work on her. Yeah, I might I might be the new Scott Rockus. So I'll come out there with with my my iPhone and take really shitty photos, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and like, and then everyone will be like. Why didn't you bring Scott back to take really nice photos? Yeah, just like, what, to, my iPhone photos aren't good enough? Just to be clear, when she said be like Scott and take really shitty photos, she meant be like Scott and not not like Scott because Scott takes really good photos. Yeah. No, Scott takes amazing photos. I was saying that I would take them with my iPhone and they'd be really shitty. Do you feel <laughs> they, a, wouldn't, they would pale. Do you feel a sense of I got to go back and finish that race? I do. I actually do. And I hate that I do because I don't. <laughs> want to go back right now. <laughs> um, but no, I'll go back. I just, you know, I want to be ready for it. And, and I was ready for it this year, but I want to be like mentally ready. I think that I wasn't prepared for the like extreme loneliness and boredom that I would experience on a course like that. You know what you should do to prepare yourself is you should come <laughs> earlier and you should do Tuscobia. Because if you want to talk about extreme boredom and loneliness, it's a, you know, completely straight, completely flat trail. There's not Yeah, see, that's the thing is I don't want to go to Tuscobia because if I fail at Tuscobia, then I have two races that I don't want to redo. <laughs> but I have to. So is that a thing for you? You have to finish everything that you sign up for? No, obviously not. But, about- but I like to. I mean... What about you, Laura? Do you have an issue with that? Because pe- people talk to me about this topic all the time, and I'm fascinated by it. Um, yeah, I've, I've, uh, I, I prefer to finish, and it makes me pretty angry when I don't. I mean, I, you know, I don't, I don't go in them to win them, but I do go in them to finish them. Like, even if I'm last, I don't care if I'm last. I just want to finish. And um, I've even been told, like, you know, you're done. There's nothing left. I've ripped off my bib, handed it to the person. I said, fuck you. I'm going. And I kept going. <laughs> so, so yeah, I do. I, I mean, I'm in them to finish them, which I think is part of my problem sometimes in the enjoyment factor is that, you know, if I'm cutting it too close or whatever, that maybe I'm not, you know, I don't enjoy it as much. But, um, you know, some of that comes with experience too, you know, it, it, it was hard, like when you're going from road running to trail running to then doing ultras, it, it, it's all a learning curve. And then going into the winter ultras, it's a whole nother, you know, it's a whole nother learning curve because you, you're not moving the same. Your body mechanics aren't the same. You know, you you have to adjust for energy, not only consumption, but, you know, how much energy you're putting out. You got to feed, like, you know, when we were, running and it was well packed we were doing great all of a sudden you're hole punching and you're sweating and so you got to be taking in a lot more calories and so like constantly having all of these types of things in your mind is very different than just going out and doing you know a 10k road run right i mean i feel like i my relationship with with well with pain with time and um my approach to racing, all three of those things dramatically changed over the course of this year so far. Just like yeah. from the standpoint of like, 
uh, even in, in the last race in, in Active Epica when we would be have like, you know, okay, we're going to post hole for two miles. Like my right. my new attitude was just like, well, this is going to be interesting. I mean, yeah. I'll, I'll get through it. I don't know how, but, you know, I'll just keep moving forward and eventually I won't have to experience this anymore. And whereas in the past, you know, it would it would take up so much of my mental space and the negativity and the, maybe I should just quit and why am I doing this and this sucks. And, you know, and now it's just like, well, this is a unique challenge that I'll overcome at some point, you know. Um, right. Yeah, so definitely staying positive, that mental attitude and staying positive is a huge factor. Being able to pull yourself out and being able to realize it's temporary. Right. Like this, you know, other than a physical, you know, like I've DNF where I dislocated my knee running down a mountain or, you know, if if it's a mental issue, you need to it, and sometimes that'll happen. Right. And then, you know, you're done. Bleh, you rage quit. But you have to be able to kind of push yourself. That, and that's what you have to learn to say, hey, yep, this is temporary. This is going to pass. Get through it now. And then, I mean, when I was going up that pass, I told Naomi, I was so cold and I, and I was literally like, I mean, I was just didn't know what I was going to do. And I was getting a little negative and all of a sudden the lights and all I said was, I was like, thank you, God. Thank you, God. You just saved me because that is the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. In my, and, and I'm not a super religious person. And I, those were the literal words that came out of my mouth. Yeah, I mean, I, I think you just start having a conversation about how you're going to finish rather than why you're going to quit. Like everything just becomes... Oh, that's what, absolutely. You know, this yeah. is something I'm going to overcome. And like for, for me and Tim, the, in the first race, it was like minus 20, let's say. You know, we reached a point where we got really scared like because we were so right. cold that we couldn't get warm. Because, you know, like, I don't know if you had this, but like you take a break to do something and then everything's really cold. And then you're like right. scared because it's not warming up. And then you like jog a little bit and it's still not warming up. And you start hiking faster and pumping your hands and they're still not warm. And you're like, holy shit, this is a really big deal. It's not. And then all of a sudden it warms up and you're like, oh, that's better. Right. You know? Yeah. We had we right. had that happen where we just never got warm. And, and then we just stopped and we put our parkas on and our Nolan's mitts and walk two miles an hour for like an hour. And right. within like five minutes of being in that park on those Nolan mitts, I was fucking toasty, you know? And then, right. then it just right. hit us kind of like something snapped where it's like, well, this is an option all weekend long. Anytime we want, we can right. just do this again. And then that like totally changes your perspective because the, the things that you fuck up and that, and the things that, you know, where you make your bad decisions is when you're panicking you know exactly yeah and, and you got to get you got to try to kind of overcome that but you know and i think it also is going to help in in other races having these winter race experiences make things like you know when you go to superior let's say the things that people struggle with at superior trail 100 are it's a longer section in between aid stations it's more time in between aid stations you know it's you know a lot of technical places where you can't move very fast and these are all things that you know, when you get there, you're going to be like, well, this is nothing compared to what I had to do in Alaska, you know, <laughs> what it's, it's at least be, it's not 30 below, <laughs> right? It's going to be three yeah. hours in between aid stations. That doesn't seem very long, you know? Yeah. Um, but the difference is if you fall at superior, you'll break your head open. You know, the worst thing in the snow is that you fall in some fluff. Well, no, the worst thing, worst thing that in the snow is you get, get oh, frostbite true. and you die, you know? Well, that's true. Or you lose we your did, finger. They did actually, they did have, a, I think, a skier, right, that had got frostbite on her on her thumbs. Yeah, and they had a biker who slipped on the ice and hurt his hip. Yeah. Let me look at what happened to Grant Maughan at, at Iditarod. I mean, and, and that's a guy that's tougher than all three of us put together and more experienced than all three of us put together. And he got yeah. the frostbite to hell. Oh, yeah, frostbite scares me. Yeah, I mean that—that that is the only thought that I had in the last twenty miles of of uh, Arrowhead. I, I'm frostbit. I know I'm frostbit. Wiggle my toe. Wiggle my toe. Jog, 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 jog. God, I hope I'm not frostbit. Wiggle my toe. Wiggle my toe. I mean, I just kept doing that over and over again for like four hours. No frostbite at all. It wasn't even close. <laughs> Any any <laughs> mantra that gets you through. <laughs> yeah, hope I'm not frostbit. All right, so Naomi's coming back to Arrowhead. Lourdes is coming only <laughs> if Lester comes. That no, that I mean, I I I really 
I'd like to go back. I'd like to, um, I'd like to give it another go. You know, I just got to kind of see, right. Like it, it's expensive. It's, it's different when you can just drive there. Right. Yeah. Like we really can't we have to fly. Yeah. These are drivable for me. That's that, that makes all like the, the Scobie is six hours away. It makes all like, to be fair, a lot of the people in Alaska only do the Alaska ones. They've done them for 10, 15 years, but they only do the Alaska ones. And to be fair, if if I lived there, I would do, I would do this race every year. I liked it that much, and I would train on those trails. I would just go out there and do it myself. Yeah, I mean that's kind of how I feel about Tuscobia because it's so close and it's so cheap. It's like 150 right. bucks. It's five hours away or six hours away. I mean, why would I yeah. not do that race? It, yeah, that's right. It's a training run. If you know, you could always do the 80. Yeah, well, that's what I'm going to do this do year as a trainer for. Arrowhead, because there's a lot of people in my running group that really want to try it, but they're kind of afraid. And I said, well, why don't we just all do the 80 together? Right. There's a 36 hour cutoff for 80 miles, you know, two miles an hour basically is all you got to do. I think we can. Yeah. There's a 36 hour cutoff for the 80 80 miles. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. And it's flat. Yeah. Flat as a pancake. Mm hmm. I think I think (laughs) well, I mean, I think it's just you know that that it just works out that way. That that's when when you would have to be. I'd be I'd be running so much running. There's also 45 miles between aid stations, so that that sometimes 45. Yeah, it's 35, 45. There's only there's only one aid station in the 80. You mean two? One. The finish line is an aid station, I assume. It's an aid station that doesn't do anybody any good when you're suffering. That's true. <laughs> well, <laughs> think about it. It'd be fun. Come to the 80. There's no no rivers or, or lakes to go over because I've had enough of that. I'm done with the rivers and the lakes. That's <laughs> active epica. Yeah, I didn't understand... Sketchy. I read, I read your race report. I didn't understand your fear on the. I mean, everybody else is on the river. You could see people or on the lake. You see people on the lake in front of you. What was your fear? Was it just? Uh, well, first of all, let's clarify. There was no one on the lake in front of me, and there was no one in the lake behind okay. me. It was just me on the lake. Okay. Um, oh. And all I could hear was like crackling noises. Yeah. But um, it was. Well, don't ever go to Sitna then, because that whole thing is on a river. Well. It's lack of experience. Like, if we would have had at the Prue Race meeting, if they would have said, hey, and just so everybody knows, there's like five feet of frozen ice and you're not going to fall through the lake. That's all I needed to hear, you know? That would have been fine. But, like, having never run across the lake before, when someone's like, oh, yeah, you're going to run across the lake, I'm like, whoa, I I think I need more information about this running on the lake thing. (laughs) You know, especially because I'm all alone. If I fall into the lake, who's going to know I'm even out here at this point, you know? Um, so then you, you probably don't know this story, but then at the, at the active Epica, there was this river and I went early and I ran on the river and the river was fine. And I was like, Oh, I feel good about this. I'm going to end running on this river. But then the river got really sketchy over the weekend. (laughs) It was really sketchy. So then I I like Sue Lucas is like, send me a text when you get on the river. I want to come see you finish. So I sent her a text and then I said, Oh, Hey, by the way. Are you 100% sure this river thing is okay? Because it is really fucking scary out here, and I do not <laughs> feel comfortable about this. And she right. didn't respond. No response. So then I get to the finish, and she says, oh, by the way, they kind of closed the river down. It was a little sketchy. And I was just like, <sighs> She's like hey, Chicago, I didn't want to tell you because you're already out there. I'm like, thanks a lot. <laughs> but, so then where um, were you supposed to run? They rerouted people around it. Oh, okay. So, like, all the people the next day, they all finished running on, like, a road next to the river. It was, you know, no big deal. Uh, but that that's an interesting race, too. I mean, something to, to check out. I mean, Winnipeg's local. I've, I've, pic- I've, I've seen the pictures. It looks pretty terrible. I'm kind of a picture person. If I look at the pictures and it looks nice, I want to do it. But if I look at the pictures and it looks terrible, then pretty much I don't. Okay. Yeah, well, there were some sections that were pretty terrible. But hey. yeah, but I like to Winnipeg, and I, I want to go back because I want to take my wife there and show it to her. She'd like to see it. Yeah. All right. So, and then for, let's talk about the rest of the year now. So now that you're done being a winter badass, Naomi, you don't want to run anymore, and you're gonna you're gonna sh- what, you're shipping your van to Hawaii. Is that the plan? Tell us tell us your plan. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, so I registered for the Tahoe 200, but I don't think they're going to do it. Um, I gave myself permission during White Mountain. <laughs> and I got to know that's bullshit, right? Yeah, nothing, gotta, nothing really counts that you decide while you're running a hundred mile winter ultra. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I mean, it kind of does though, whenever you're like, your hips are rotated and you need to fix them before you ever run another hundred miles again. <laughs> so I got a lot of physical therapy to, to do to, to like straighten some things out. Um, I, like I was born like this in my entire life. So it's funny because it pounds, like I don't know it until I'm like six, seventy, and cause, um, like it just doesn't bother me until you've done the same poor form for like 60 and 70 miles. And then all of a sudden your knee is like the size of a baseball <laughs> and, uh, you're we're kind of losing, we're kind of losing you, Naomi. Are you in a, are you in a bad spot here? Uh, she might need to put some yeah. aluminum foil on her head or something or stand on top of her <laughs> A colander. Yeah. We're losing you, Naomi. I'm here. I can hear you. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're you're back. It's it's because I live in it's because I live in this closet. You know, <laughs> I don't even have I don't even have cell service in here. <laughs> I'm in a bomb shelter. Um, right, so you're not going to do a Tahoe 200. You have a knee issue, and we can post a picture of your knee if we have to. But what's your plan then for the rest of the year? Yeah, I'm gonna. Sh- I want to ship my van to Hawaii, and me and my dog are going to move down there for the winter. Um. And just run the local trails. The Lord has got me psyched on uh, volunteering at the Hurt. Um, yeah, just like switch up the scene for a little bit. I'm young, and I I like have some property here in Tahoe, so I'll be in Tahoe for the rest of my life. So like now is the time to like ship your van to Hawaii and live in it. <laughs> so then, if we all want to camp in Tahoe, you can tell us where to go if we want to do some camping. Oh yeah, yo, I got like. Three and a half acres you can camp on. And then you're going to sign up for the Hurt 100 and run it if you get in and volunteer if you don't? Yeah. I mean, it depends. Uh, I I love winter ultras, and so it would be, like, counterintuitive to do a non-winter ultra in the winter. But if I'm going to be living there, like, this would be the time to do it. So... All right. And speaking of Hurt, now you've done Hurt, Lourdes. Don't you think that it's a good idea for her to run it? Um, I think if she gets her knee fixed, <laughs> it, it would be it, not a lot of running going on at her. Yeah. It's a lot of technical and climbing and, uh, descending. So your knees really have to be tip top shape. I actually DNF there cause I, I developed a Baker cyst. I had dislocated my knee six months at, before in August at a race here in Calgary in the mountains called Iron Legs. And, um, I ended up with a Baker cyst developing off the back of that knee in like the fourth loop coming into the aid station. And, um, it pretty much ended my, unfortunately, but so I, I, but I went back the next year and I volunteered and I paced because uh, like the arrowhead, it's, it's a family, like the hurt is it's, and it's a beautiful family and it's, and they are wonderful, wonderful people. And if they weren't, you know, a $600 flight away, I would go there every year as well. Well, so and it's, it's smack hard. dab in the middle of the winter ultras too. So that doesn't help. That's well, well, I wasn't in the winter ultras when I did it, you know, this was three or three years ago. So, um, that weekend you know, I, is like I, my wedding anniversary this year, and my wife has already made clear that if I chose to, we could go there for our, our anniversary, and I could do the Hurt One Hundred. But uh, yeah. I don't. So want to then, the then I would definitely, you know, put your name in. A lot of people get in off the wait list. It's very different. It's it's definitely a mental challenge. Definitely, you know, it's uh, you're doing the same thing five times, and that can be challenging sure so it's you know definitely one of those kind of you got to grind it out um and it's it's tough it's really really tough and you know part of me wishes i had just kept pushing through i don't know that i would have finished or if the thing would have exploded or not but you know it just it i was completely freaked out i got in a really negative headspace and 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 that actually that dnf is what taught me 
that mentally I had to be that physically, you know, obviously I wasn't fine in the sense that I developed Baker cyst, but that the, the, everything else had timed out well, I was, you know, going well on the course, but mentally I wasn't strong enough, you know? So, so. what's your plan for the rest of the year? Uh, for this year, I have, um, a Blackfoot 50 miler. That's a local, it's in Edmonton, a very runnable, like on grass, deceivingly hard in the sense that it's, you know, up, down, up, down, but really nice. A great group of people that run it. I've, I've run it two years now. I ran it, I did the hundred K one year and the 50 K one year. And so this year I'm going to do the 50 mile and then I have Western States and then I have Superior. You're doing Western States? Yeah. Oh, nice. Is this your first try there? Yeah. You got picked in the lottery? Uh, yeah. That's exciting. I, don't, I didn't realize yeah. that. You don't sound I'm very excited. Why, what are you terrified of? Uh, the 30-hour cutoff. Oh. That's, yeah, it's pretty tight. But I know Naomi's going to be there, and, and Lester has said he's going to come out to pace me, so I'm... That's making me more excited just because, you know, we had such a great time all together at Arrowhead and then Naomi and I again in Alaska. So, you know, that, that's another reason why I do these things is because I live a pretty, you know, pretty simple, pretty sheltered life here in Calgary, kind of isolated except for my local running friends. And so when I go to these things and I meet people that you kind of click with, and then you you see them and it's it's like a way to you know it's it's kind of like one of those things like we don't see each other for a couple months to get together it's like we just saw each other last week like I literally when we I first got to the hotel I looked at Naomi I was like I feel like we were just here what are we doing <laughs> you know <laughs> and it's been three months <laughs> like, yeah and then and I yeah. almost couldn't believe the night before like we were gonna do this again like what the hell is wrong with us. <sighs> You should, you should have been at that hotel the night before the act of Epica. I was just like, what? I, I can't even imagine. I was sitting in my chair looking at it. I was like, I cannot believe they're fucking doing this again. Like, it hasn't even. I was still, like, barely thinking I felt good yet. You know, like, you guys, the way you guys recovered and got through those things, it was, I mean, you guys didn't just pace one really good race. You paced three back-to-back races very, very well in the sense that, not only did you pace them and finish them each, but you recovered well between them to get through the next. And they progressively, I felt like, got harder. It's so hard to say because they were all hard in a different way, you know? Right, in different ways, in different ways for sure. Yeah. But I think just maybe Active Epica wasn't the hardest, like as far as the the uh, run goes, but be compound it with the fact that you had just done two others like the amount of tired that your body was compared to say the first one. You see what I'm saying? Oh, sure. And, and those guys made it worse by doing the hundred mile, which, you know, they didn't need to do. They, they just wanted to get that right. extra 25 miles in. So they had, they had cutoffs. Cutoffs were in their head, you know, whereas right, for me right. it was don't get lost and keep moving. And you're going to, you're going to finish with plenty of time to spare. They were like in yeah. and out of a couple aid stations where they had to hurry up. So they were in a different right. situation. Um, and that in Superior, too. So Superior in Western States. Wow, you're having a nice little year. Arrowhead, White Mountain, Superior, Western States. Whew. And Superior is, is going gonna, is gonna to feel like home again, too. You'll, you'll know so many people there, and it'll be so nice, and you'll want to keep going back. There's like a, they, they talk about it. It's Minnesota nice. All those people yeah. are just awesome. It's like one of those races. Arrowhead and, and um, Superior are both races that my wife would always go to because they're just so nice and the people are so awesome there. And and that's what I heard. I mean, I ran, I don't know if you know a guy named Tim Loopfer. Yeah. Several years ago, uh, we were together in a race and we were running along and he was telling me about it. And at that race, Helen and Scott were there and he was telling me, so he was telling me about Tuscobia. And so, you know, one of the reasons I'd like to go to Tuscobia is be, I like to support them as race directors. Uh, I don't know that I'd be interested in doing the 160, but the 80 for sure I would love to go and do. And just to support. And then they were so, so nice They're at Arrowhead. So I mean, nice. I, They're super nice people. They're, it's just like Scott sat with me like three or four different times and Chris. said, you know, Chris Scott. Or, or Chris, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah Chris. Yeah, he's like. 
um, you know, you're going to be fine. You're going to be, you know, and he was just, they were so calming and, you know, I just, it, it meant a lot. It really meant a lot to me. There's such good, and, you know, it's, it's like doing Tuscobia. So I went, when you go to Tuscobia, I saw them at the pre-race meeting and then you start and then you don't see them again for three days, you know, and then by the time you see them, you're all fucked up anyway. So it, it, right. it, it you know, it's kind of weird that you don't, it's like, I even said to them, cause we were sitting around, we, we get all done with this. It's like, so 63 hours later and I'm dying and I haven't slept right. really in, in three days cause I didn't sleep. And, uh, um, right. and then Tim passes out. And then I sat up all night with the scotches, eating animal crackers while they're drinking beer, talking. And I look at the <laughs> clock. I'm like, it's five o'clock. And why are we still, why am I still up? You know, like I should, I should right. be sleeping, but I just, I only see them twice a year and you know, they're lovely people. So I think you should do the 80, come do the 80 with all of us. It'll be a big party. Yeah. We, we could talk Naomi into it. We could, we could have her um, van sent by a tanker through the. Erie Canal or something. <laughs> we just got to get the van here, and then she could come. Um, but that'll yeah, be awesome. We got to bring the van to the Arrowhead. That would be cool. That would be cool. It's a long drive, man. Whew. I, I, yeah. I definitely. I, yeah. What was the road that I DNF'd at? Bunny Road or whatever. Um, uh, Sheep Ranch Road. No. That yeah. Yeah, Sheep Ranch Road. If my van was at Sheep Ranch Road, I'd DNF every year. <laughs> Don't feel bad. I DNF at Sheep Ranch Road too. It was it was the it was the death of me. Uh, but you know the other cool thing about Tuscobia is there's all kinds of like restaurants and bars in a few spots, so you can just like leave your sled and just run into the bar and like eat a pizza and drink some beers and then go back out and keep going. So that's kind of fun. That's a nice feature. Me and me and Tim did that. We had like Red Bulls in the middle of the night. So, all right. That was cool. Well, um, anything else? Anything else about the race that that we didn't talk about or we didn't cover? Anything else? Story you want to tell? Did, didn't um, did Naomi poop herself or you know did something? <laughs> something you, you guys are holding back. <laughs> I'll let Naomi go. All I got to say is that Lourdes's, <laughs> yeah, Lourdes's pee pee smells like poop. <laughs> <laughs> so at some point you smelled her pee during the race. <laughs> Wait, did anybody, have, did anybody no. have to pee no, or I, poop in the minus 28 degrees? No. I did. No. I had, I had the shits out there and I had such horrible butt cheek chafing. It was not, not fun. Uh, cheek on cheek, cheek on cheek, cheek on cheek. Yeah, Ugh. you know that that two times had- they make a special butt chafing de- um, object too. It's called um, what do you call it? It's like butt butt cream or something. It's just like it's like body glide, but you put it in your butt. I think it's like nut butter, isn't it? No, no. This is by Two Toms, which is the it's what I use. Oh, okay. But they have like a they have wipes. It's like single serving wipe, and you can just wipe it on your butt, and then it um, keeps the chafage down. But yeah, twenty bucks says that wipe would have been frozen. <sighs> <laughs> yeah, see, you forget about the fact that everything works differently at minus twenty eight. You know, but you know what you could do? You could take that wipe and you could stick it in you like your pants for like an hour and thaw it out and then you could wipe your butt with it. How's that? I would be afraid that I'd get frostbite by putting something frozen on my direct skin. Yeah. Well, we'll fig- I mean, that, that was always my fear. Yeah. <laughs> we'll figure something out, but yeah, I feel sorry for you. Cause I've had that. I've had like the, just the butt cheek chafage galore. And it's not nice. Not nice at all. And you know, speaking of monoton- monotonous, I got I got a hundred fifty mile race next weekend, <sighs> ten mile loops. So beat that for yeah. What? It's ten mile loops. How many? The, hold on, I can't do math. 15, 15. 10 mile loops. Yep, fifteen ten mile loops. So that'll be fun. Wow. Will there be aid stations along the loop? There are th- three aid stations for every ten mile loop. Oh, okay. Which almost seems What's the cutoff? silly. Uh, fifty-two hours. So oh, you got that. It's flat. 
Uh, it's like, it's Illinois flat. I mean, there's some hills that you have to like climb up with a rope cause they're super steep, but they're not very tall. You know, it's like maybe 1600 feet of climbing per loop. So not, it's not, not flat, but it, but it's not mountainous. So it's, uh, the big problem with that race is mud. Like if it gets muddy, then it's oh, a yeah. shit show. So what's the, what's the forecast looking like? <sighs> It's probably some rain and some cold, nothing, you know, it's, it's yeah. not terrible. And, you know, I've suffered a lot. So like, I think my ambivalence to suffering will probably be my greatest asset in this. I'll be able to <laughs> get it done. And then looking forward to just trading and some, doing some running, you know, like lots of running, running. So that'll be good after all of this, but I'll for sure be at Tuscobia and I'll for sure be at Arrowhead if Ken Kruger lets me in and, um, it sounds like you guys have a very good running like club or a group of people, you know, where you are. Yeah, very we, supportive. We, have, uh, we started a group here called the Flatlanders, and we have 1,400 people in the, in the club. Wow. Yeah. Nice. So, what? Yeah, 1,400. It's Flatlander Ultra Runners in Chicagoland. And, wow. Uh, are you trying to convert? them to winter ultra runners <laughs> uh, some of them i mean they followed along for sure but it's you know in, in the group it's kind of like it's grown more outside of chicago too like there's people from all over the country that are in it just because it's a good resource where there's one of the rules is you can only talk about trail and ultra running so you don't get a lot of like you know marathon type stuff or just everyday runner type stuff it's more of a ultra centered um community and it's small enough that you can ask questions and get feedback, but not so big like that trail and ultra running group where it's just like 57,000 people and you, you know, you can't keep track of what's going on. So, um, yeah, it's nice. And we have, we have people from all over the world. It's kind of, you know, that just want to wow. learn about ultra running. We founded that, uh, three years ago. So it's three years old and 14, 1,408 members. And this race is part like supported by this, or this is just something else that you were signed up for. This the Flatlander Ultra Runners in Chicago is just a group that I formed like okay. three years ago. And what one of the things that we do is a lot of aid stations and a lot of fat asses, and we support oh, yeah, nice. races. So yeah, so like we'll have the aids, we'll have two of the aid stations at this hundred fifty mile race that I'm okay. doing. Um, wow! And that's you know, and we yeah and give back. So go ahead with the beer bong and the controversy and. <laughs> I mean, that was partly 10 Junk Miles, too, though. So, like, 10 Junk Miles is a completely separate standalone entity from, from the Flatlanders. And Flatlanders, th- that the Flatlander Ultra Runner group we set up, it's nonprofit. It um, doesn't sell you anything. Nobody makes any money off of anything. It's all just, like, <laughs> grassroots, trail running, no bullshit, and no politics. Whereas, you know, 10 Junk Miles is, you know, they make some money. So... A lot of times what will happen is we'll do an aid station, 10 Junk Miles and Flatlanders, and then 10 Junk Miles wants to, like, bring the beer and, you know. So just so Lourdes knows, we actually had a beer bong at a race, and, and then they got we got in trouble. So <laughs> we, we were challenged to come back next year and not have alcohol. And we, oh, nice. We, we don't want to accept that challenge because we think that alcohol and trail racing go together like Batman and Robin. Okay. Was like there, efficient carb loading. Yeah. Was it? Was there any drinking at the at the um, White Mountains? Mm, n- not that I saw. Yeah. I have no idea. I think it would be bad. I mean, there's in the like winter. Yeah, it was like ten of us. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and the, and to be fair, like you know, the first two people finished in like twenty five hours, and the next six of us all finished within you know a couple hours of each other. So, and we were all sort of playing tag at the aid station. So it was really nice. Like Biat and Virginia, who's from the Yukon would, were kind of ahead and then they would be there and then we'd come in and then they would kind of go and then we'd be there and then we'd be, you know, kind of getting ready to go and Naomi and Tony would show up. So it was like the six of us, even though we weren't necessarily kind of, we, you know, it was like you were kind of looking forward to seeing other people too. It was. So what would you say to, to some of the people? Like, I know there are people in the running group that say they really want to go do these winter ultras, but they're just scared, you know, that they just, they're just scared. 
What advice? Be scared. You, you should be scared. <laughs> yeah. I'd say to be scared. <laughs> I mean, I'd say that you never, you never know. Like we had really good conditions at the White Mountain, and you never know what it's going to be next year. Yeah. Like, like you can read someone's race report and be like, that sounds like an amazing race. I want to do it. And then the next year it's negative 40 and it dumps 10 feet of snow. Like you just never know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's what I usually tell people when they say something like they'll say, oh, well, you did, you know, Arrowhead. The, it was a mild year this year. And you're like, well, y- you don't have balls for showing up to the race on race day. You have balls for signing up, not knowing what it's going to be like on race day. Cause I mean, That's right. it could be minus 30 or it could be, you know, 30. You, yeah. But you I mean, no idea. the fact that it was, a, the fact that it was a mild year made it a total grind too. Especially with I mean, the snow. that snow was so soft. I'm not saying that it hasn't been worse conditions other years, but all that fresh snow that we got, yeah, you know, that's it. it the, the issue is you always have to be prepared for what you can't prepare for Mm -hmm. because you never know what the conditions are going to be. I mean, mother nature is a bitch and she will slap you across the face. First chance she gets. Yep. Well, and And you got to be ready. You got to be ready to slap her back. And I think that it makes you a better ultra runner and it makes you more flexible and and you can kind of go with the flow, even when it throws hard shit at you. Because like, I look at now, for example, this race with the three aid stations, every 10 miles. And you're like, fuck, I mean, Three aid stations, every, <laughs> and and ten and ten miles is is going to be less than three hours. So like every hour, I'm close to a child's birthday party, basically. You know, right? I mean, <laughs> what, what the, how, that that doesn't even yeah, sound. Yeah, but you can't become you can't become complacent because that may be true for the first say three or four loops, but you know by that fifteenth, you know I'd say by the tenth, maybe even by the seventh loop, it's it's going to and and mentally you're thinking oh. I still got seven more loops of this. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? So oh, it's, sure. they all have their challenges. They, they do, they do. And th- I think that's the biggest difference. Like with ultra running is that you have to, there's so many peaks and valleys and ups and downs that you go through physically, mentally, and then depending on what the course is and what you're facing and what you know, you're going to face, you know, in a point to point, there's always that unknown if you haven't done it before. And every step you take is a step closer to the finish. In a loop, you know, you can quit 15 times. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And so you have to be strong enough to say, nope, just got to keep going. Just got to be, you know. And uh, so that that's, it's a whole different, I mean, good on you for doing that. It was, it was where I did my first 100. And um, Kyla is actually running the aid station in the middle of the race. So I'll get, nice. to, I'll get to see her. Uh, 30 times. It also has two river crossings per loop too. So you're going to have wet feet twice every 10 miles, which is a really cool feature. I'll take some good trench trench foot pictures so that, you know, I can one up Naomi's trench foot. Yeah. Oh yeah, man. (laughs) That sounds terrible. (laughs) But see everybody, that's the great thing about, I think the trail ultra running is that there's, there's something for everybody. You know, there's some people that like to run desert. Some people like to run in the snow. Some people like to run in the mountains. Some people like to run bad water. I mean, it's it's all it's all good and it's all crazy in its own way. And the nice thing is, is like just when you think you're the craziest, you see somebody else and you're like, oh no, that is crazy. And just so you think, <laughs> so it makes you feel kind of normal, right? And then when you see that guy, then you then you find somebody else who's even crazier than that guy who's even crazy. I mean, people think that I'm crazy, and then I'm like. What about Bayat? You know, I mean, that guy's fun. Go to his, <laughs> you go to his blog, which he probably hasn't updated in like five years and look at the, his list of races. I don't even know half of those races. And they're like hundreds, yeah. they're like a hundred hours. And I'm like, what the fuck is that? You know, like what are these races that he's <laughs> doing? You know, how, how cool was he? Come on, be honest with me. Take me there. I want to feel like, oh, I'm, he- like I'm there with him. <laughs> Super laid back. I thought. Yeah. I walked with him for like, a few miles, maybe like four or five into the first aid station or maybe not that many. Um, yeah, we talked about our jobs. He's, he works for Google and we, we talked a lot about engineering and code. Yeah. We pretty much literally only talked about work. <laughs> That's nice. With, with like one yeah, of the greatest but, winter ru- ultra runners of all time in a winter ultra. And you didn't talk about winter ultras at all. You just talked about work. <laughs> yeah. We talked about, I talked about how, 
I lived in Tahoe and how they just moved from the Bay Area. And I said, oh, that's a bummer because I don't like Boulder. Um, and I lived I lived in Colorado for four years. So so I feel like justified saying that I don't like it. <laughs> but I do like it, but I just wouldn't live there again. Um, but yeah, he, he said that if he, the one thing I took away, he said that if he could work remote like I do, he uh, he him and Jill would move to Alaska. And I was like, sounds like you got to rally Google to get a Alaska office. Yeah, for sure. Um, all right. Well, I think that just about covers everything. Uh, you guys have been very generous with your time. It's almost two hours. Um, I guess that's it. So, um,
Thank you.